Released by Square Enix in 2012 on the Nintendo 3DS and regarded as a spiritual sequel to Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light, Bravely Default was actually developed by a different team, being written by Naotaka Hayashi and directed by Kensuke Nakahara. Producer Tomio Asano and artist Akihiko Yoshida both returned to the same art style and monster designs as Four Heroes, and the gameplay retains its job system mechanics, featuring 24 distinct jobs, as well as refining the action point-based combat system from Four Heroes, which now allows enemies and allies to save and spend any number of their action points in a system called Brave and Default. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. Set in the world of Luxendark, we are introduced to the main cast, Agnes, a vestal for the Wind Crystal, who is present when darkness suddenly comes to consume its light, Ringabel, a charismatic wanderer with amnesia and a book of prophecies, Adia, a young warrior in training from the land of Eternia, being sent on a mission to apprehend the Wind Vestal in Caldisla, and Tiz, a common shepherd in the village of Narende, when, without warning, a giant chasm opens up and swallows his brother in town. The story begins with Tiz waking up a week later in the nearby city of Caldisla, where Tiz is the only survivor of the disaster that hit Narende. Wanting to head back and investigate, the king of Caldisla warns him the chasm has unleashed darkness and monsters to make the trip dangerous, and he cannot offer aid as his troops are currently fighting the Sky Knights of Eternia. Gearing up as a freelancer and returning to Narende, Tiz sees the devastation, and not far from him is Agnes, offering prayers to those fallen. He presses her for answers, but their chat is cut short when an Eternian airship descends towards them. Knowing they are there for her, Agnes begins to flee but is cut off, and Tiz grabs her by the hand and they hurry to escape their cannon fire. As their attackers Barris the Monk and Holly the White Mage pull back, they catch their breath, and Agnes and her companion Aerie the Christ Fairy introduce themselves. She explains that she is on her way to Anshim to stop the corruption of the crystals that support the energy of the world before everything is taken by darkness, though crossing the sea will be difficult now that the sea is rotted. Aerie identifies Tiz as the miracle bringer to a skeptical Agnes and tells Tiz that by releasing the light stored up in all the crystals, the world will regain order and remove the chasm. Tiz now wants to accompany her, but Agnes insists on going the trip alone. Returning to the King of Caldisla, Tiz reports that Narende is really gone, but he will be built, and the King appoints him chairman of the restoration effort, effective immediately. Though again, he's currently in a bind as long as the Eternian airships keep their own forces grounded as they search for the Wind Vestal. Agnes reveals herself as the person whom they are searching for, apologizes for the inconvenience, and moves to resolve the issue. Aerie proposes surrendering to the Eternians, as not only will they leave Caldisla alone, they'll take her across the sea anyway. As it turns out, Agnes has a terrible sense of direction, and will need a guide to the lake where the Eternians are camped, and Tiz volunteers to help her there. As she approaches to surrender, Tiz speaks up and asks that they don't kill her, which Holly agrees to, saying Agnes will only be tortured to the brink of death instead. Refusing those terms, Tiz and Agnes fight back, and upon defeating the duo, they pick up the Monk and White Mage asterisks, and thus gain their jobs. Agnes thanks Tiz for his intervention and welcomes him along the journey, and Ares suggests stealing their airship and using it to cross the sea, though the ship retreated elsewhere. Returning to Caldisla, the king is impressed to hear that it defeated the two Eternian officers threatening his city, and they learn the main force is in Lontano Villa, beyond a broken bridge. As they rest from their first victory against the Duchy of Eternia, they are woken up in the middle of the night as Adia of Eternia has infiltrated the city, and the Black Mage officer Ominous is setting the city on fire in search of Agnes. They retreat to Centro Keep north of the city, and as Agnes moves to go there and stop their hostility, Ringabel comes in, somehow knowing exactly who Tiz and Agnes are. He explains that although he himself has amnesia, his journal has notes of events and people to come with alarming accuracy. Ringabel desires to join them in order to meet Adia, though reluctantly, Agnes allows him along. Inside Centro Keep, Adia argues with Ominous about his methods as Tiz and the group make their way through the keep and confront them. Ominous lets loose his flame, not caring if even his own men take collateral damage. Finding his dishonorable actions intolerable, Adia takes charge of the group and turns to take down Ominous. As he falls, they gain his Black Mage Asterisk, and Adia does not mind turning traitor in light of the many lies she's been fed by her country. Ringabel notes this event too was foreseen by his journal, including their taking of an airship. On cue, an airship is seen flying south on an attack vector towards Caldisla, as it turns out, Knight's Captain Heinket is appearing to take the city, managing to wipe out the entire Royal Guard by himself. Arriving too late, the group finds a dying Captain Owen who tells them the King was taken. Adia is angry at her country's actions and offers to lead the group to Eternia's camp at Lantano Villa, though Agnes is reluctant to trust her so quickly. Pretending to have captured the Vestal as per her original mission, Adia helps them gain access to Heinken's camp, 
and Anya sees firsthand how much the Chrysalis orthodoxy she's come from is hated among Eternians. However, before they can reach the captured king, some guards who are aware of Adia's defection recognize her, blowing their cover. Bolting for Heinket, they find him with the king, offering to trade him for Agnes. Adia calls him out as a coward, and he sends his men to stall for time as he moves towards his airship. Ringabel smells a trap, but they brave it anyway, believing them cornered. Heinket now goes on the attack, but the group turns the tables and succeed in defeating him, gaining his night job. However, the airship is now out of control, though Ringabel consults his journal and finds precise piloting instructions for their exact ship, the Echelot, and safely lands. Returning the king safely, he offers Tiz the title of Knight's Captain, but Tiz refuses in light of his commitment to Agnes's mission, though they do get to keep the Eternian airship, if only by default. Now flying south, Agnes explains that Eternia is after her as part of their embrace of the new Anti-Crystal Society, and thus considers her a heretic. They all give their reasons for staying together as it seems the group is united and their journey is just beginning. Their next destination is Ansheim, an oasis city where the Temple of the Wind Crystal resides. As the next chapter of the story begins, Ringabel's journal guides them across the desert to Ansheim, while at the same time, the Lord Marshal of Eternia receives an update on the Vestal's journey from his top commanders, Alternus the Dark Knight, Victoria the Arcanist, and Victor the Spirit Master. They don't know of Agnes' reason to return to the Wind Crystal, but regardless, they employ the corrupt merchant tree of the city to apprehend her. Arriving in the city, they witness a public address by King Kamer, relaying the bad news that because the winds have died, their industrial city is in a severe economic decline. He blames the Vestal and the whole Crystal Orthodoxy, knowing full well Agnes is in the crowd. Moving on to the Temple of Wynn, Agnes' is home, they find monsters have settled into the temple and left only the bloody remnants of the Acolytes behind. Fighting their way to the Crystal Room, they see it barely holding any light, and Agnes says they need to prepare a ritual of cleansing. However, the ceremonial garb they need is destroyed and they must seek out the Sage of Yuliana Woods for a new one. Finding the Sage, they learn that he can make a new vestment, but Agnes must secure the rainbow thread he needs to craft it, located in a nearby cave. They find the mystical thread guarded by a fearsome dragon, and after rising to the challenge, they return to the Sage. As he gets to work on Agnes' ceremonial wear, she asks him about her mysterious magic pendant and the state of her friend Olivia, the Vestal of Water, as it seems water and wind were taken by darkness in the same day. He has no news, and can offer only encouragement for her tough journey ahead. Donning her new garb, Agnes and crew make their way back to the Wind Temple, where they find the darkness in the crystal has taken the shape of Orthros, bringer of doom. After defeating the ancient monster, Tiz questions how long the threat has been lurking there, but Aerie and Agnes hurry to release the light from the crystal. The crystal is relit, and as the winds return, the people of Ansheim find new hope in the orthodoxy, derailing the king's slander. They also take time to put an end to the local bandits, led by the leader Jackal and his mercenary bodyguard Kent, though Kit leaves once the fight starts to go poorly. Gaining the thief asterisk, they also learn the merchantry hired them to keep their water racketeer in front going. Confronting the merchantry leader, they end as plotting against them and the city, see a brief return of the mercenary Kent and gain the merchant job. Following the paper trail, they discover the king himself is in on all the corrupt business deals in the city for the purpose of spreading anti-crystallism. Confronting him, the king hires Spellfencer Kent to kill them and helps out being a time mage himself. Ending the corrupt reign of the king, they gain their jobs and the prime minister thanks them by stocking them up for their next destination, the water crystal in Florum. Suddenly, as they enter their ship, they are assaulted by the Dark Knight Alternus, who warns them Agnes is on a course that will ruin the world. Seeing Adia present, he opts to instead cripple the ship and leave. As the Dead Sea prevents sailing, they must cross on foot, and as such, wade through the poisonous miasma woods on the next chapter of their journey. At the same time, the Council of Six sends Victoria and Victor now to eliminate both the water vessel and the traitor Adia, though Alternus then contacts Valkyrie Einheria to talk sense into Adia before they are forced to kill her. At this time, the group arrives in Florum, finding it a city of women and luxuries, and seek the matriarch of the city. They learn Olivia has gone into hiding, and the Acolytes have abandoned the temple, allowing the temple to erode. Visiting the Temple of Water, they find it empty of both people and monsters, and the crystal shielded. Established by Olivia, as it was losing light, it protects the crystal from darkness, preserving what little light it has left. Though they could find Olivia and have her drop the barrier so they can awaken the crystal, Ares says Anya should be strong enough to do it by herself, However, Agnes insists the rite be performed by Olivia. At the same time, we see Olivia and the last few acolytes being hunted down by Valkyrie Einheria. Returning to Florum, they are at a loss for leads, so they consult Ringabel's Journal of Prophecies, and learn that Agnes is to enter the Sacred Flower Festival, which used to be a sacred ceremony, now reduced to a vain beauty pageant. Figuring this a good way to let Olivia discover her, she agrees. 
After hearing the hottest fashions are actually done by clothes from the Sage of Yoyana, mysterious hairpins from the fairy gardens nearby, and petal hue hair dye, they prepare for the contest. Along the way, they rescue a pair of girls in the nearby gardens and run into Melphilia the Summoner, sister to Einheria the Valkyrie. She's poaching fairies and reveals the popular hairpin accessories in Florm are fashioned from their wings, plucked from their dead bodies, which also have the curious effect of releasing pheromones that incite selfishness and violence, resulting in the current society in Florm, who will kill if it means being beautiful. Fighting and defeating her yields the summoner job, and as she dies, she tells Tiz that his soul is not his own. Investigating the hair dye now, they find it's an addictive hallucinogenic substance being gained by the poaching efforts of Artemia the Ranger, another of Einheria's sisters. Ending her, they gain the Ranger job and end the flow of poison the people of Florum are using on themselves. Finally, during the evening, they intercept a message warning of the Blood Rose Legion attacking the hidden village to the north. Going north to Witherwood, they find some hidden crystallists who turn out to be soldiers of Einheria in disguise. Anhiria confronts her former friend Adia, who denounces the actions of Eternia. As a result, Anhiria moves to execute them all. Defeating her, they gain the Valkyrie job and end the Three Sisters' grip over the city. Backtracking now to save Yuliana by means of a shortcut through Mount Fragmentum, they prove their mettle to gain a summon, defeat a giant land turtle on their way, and make it back to Yuliana, though, after much debate, they settle on wearing her Vestal garb during the contest after all. Meanwhile, Victoria and Victor are already in Flora, and to pass the time during their hunt for the Vestals and Adia, mutilate the likely winners of the beauty contest. The group arrives in time for the contest to start, and in the city they meet DeRosa the Red Mage. During the contest, Anya sends out a personal plea and message to Olivia, though is booed off stage by the crowd. Still, Olivia catches ear and sends a message of her whereabouts and the group moves out, with Victoria and Victor right behind them. Along the way, they spot a very suspicious DeRosa again, and following him, find him kidnapping women across the city in a plot as the captain of the Blood Rose region of Eternia. Fighting and ending him in his schemes, they gain the Red Mage job and free the captive women. Now traveling through the Twilight Ruins, they meet Olivia, a Vestal of Water, who's been on the run for years since before the darkness hit, as the Blood Rose Legion has been hunting and killing Crystallists in the Florum region after they already killed the Vestal of Fire. Suddenly, Victoria appears and throws a quick sneak attack spell at Agnes, though Olivia jumps in and takes the hit, dying instantly. As Victor steps out now, the group clashes with both members of the Council of Six at the same time. However, the group finds they are no match for the duo, but suddenly, Victoria suffers a crippling crisis of health and the duo must retreat for the time being. Turning to Olivia, she dies in Agnes's arms, leaving her as the last Crystal Vestal. With no choice but to head back to the Temple of Water, the barrier around the Crystal is gone since Olivia died, and now they are attacked by another darkness coming out of the Crystal, Rusalka, Purveyor of Doom. Defeating this monster, Agnes awakens the Water Crystal and immediately the seas clear up of darkness. Seeking the Fire Crystal next as their maiden is also gone, they head off towards Eisenberg and the Temple of Fire. Detouring to the Wind Temple again, they prove themselves able to wield the Wind Summon her as Velger. As they sail onwards, Adia chooses to reveal that she is the daughter to the man in charge of all Eternia, which Agnes angrily denounces in light of Olivia's death. As the next chapter of their journey starts, they spot a massive ship in the sea that turns out to be Grand Ship, a literal floating city. There they meet an envoy from Eisenberg named Zatz who informs them the country is in the Civil War. The rebelling faction, called the Swordbearers, are beating the home forces of the Shieldbearers thanks to the aid of the Black Blades mercenaries of Eternia. In addition, Mount Karka has erupted, stranding the Temple of Fire in the middle of lava. With the help of the shield bearers, they seek a way to the temple, and along the way, they are met by the swordmaster Kami Izumi, leader of the Black Blades and Adia's former teacher. He scolds Adia, but is called away by the war effort, and so meets with his council of Barbarossa the pirate, Kata the solve maker, Praline the performer, and Konoe the ninja. Meeting with the leaders of the shield bearers, they decline helping him out in his war, but regardless, the commander offers to help them into the fire temple just outside the town of Heartschild. Investigating, they find no way forward towards the crystal and decide to help out on the war on the side of shield bearers after all. Their first mission is to scout out the enemy keep called Grap Keep and find the source of a massive toxic mist weapon. Along the way, they sail into some fog and find the ghost ship, the Funky Francisca, captained by Barbarossa the Pirate. Defeating the naval leader of the Black Blades, they gain the pirate job and continue on. They find Salve Maker Kata, the progenitor of the Toxic Mist, and during their investigation, they trigger a security alarm in the keep that has three automatons attack them. Dismantling them, they gain the master sample of the Toxin and decide to destroy it. Back at the base, the Sword Bearers attack, now armed with superior mithril weapons, which the group learns the Black Blades have had children's slaves collect out of the mines nearby. 
Failing to repel the first push by Praline the Performer, they find a way to repel the Diva's songs by the teachings of the Bard Archipeller and defeat the enemy commander to gain the Performer job. Moving on to the Mithril Mines, they rescue the worker children within and move on to the Sword Bearer's stronghold to the north. Within, they corner and defeat the conniving Kata and gain the Salve Maker job, as well as find and rescue a slave named Egil, who knows a route to the Temple of Fire via dreams from the former Fire Vestal, and bears a striking resemblance to Tiz's brother that fell to his death. Braiding the lanes of lava underground, the ground gives way beneath the group and Egil is about to fall to his death as well. However, Tiz won't allow it, but can't hold on himself. Despite the discouragement from Eri, Agnes risks her own life to jump in and grab Tiz just in the nick of time. Continuing on, they earn the summon Promethean Fire, and once more they find another creature of darkness lashed onto the crystal, Chogmar, the Mark of Doom. Defeating this ancient monster and releasing the fire crystal, they find they stop the raging fires, but for some reason the Mithril and the Mines have abruptly disappeared. They find the tide of war shifting and the shield bearers are winning. Returning to Starkfort, Adia confronts her former teacher with her conviction to return to Eternia to awaken the Earth Crystal. And during their clash of wills, Adia and friends went over her master and gained the Swordmaster job. As they find a new home for their friend Egil, the Grand Marshal of Eternia and Alternus discuss a shift in tactics, now to an all-out defense to prevent the Earth Crystal from being awakened. When the group returns to the Shieldbearers, they find they are in time for a banquet for the commander they allegedly set up themselves, but obviously did not. Suddenly, the place is locked down, a servant is found murdered, and a death threat is issued to the commander. A murder mystery is afoot, and after collecting clues and interviewing the guests, they find the culprit is the one person they never spoke to, and it is Konoe the ninja in disguise. Avenging the killer of the Fire Vestal, they gain the ninja job, learn that the Fire Vestal actually committed suicide, and end the last of the First Division invasion officers. Going by Ringabel's journal for clues on how to proceed next, they learn that they must return to Grandship. Doing so, they find the 3,000 year old or more ship is slowly sinking, and ancient writing shows that the legendary metal Ori Calcum will let it rise again. As they evacuate the town population, they collect the precious metal from their friend Egil, enter the depths of the Grand Ship, defeat a behemoth lurking there, and insert the metal. Taking the helm, they find the ship literally rising and taking flight as a heavy duty airship. Now with the means of the Earth Crystal, the group and a small crew of allies plot a course to Adia's frozen homeland of Eternia. As the next chapter opens up, Adia informs them that ever since Eternia stamped out their own crystal orthodoxy, the Earth Temple has been remade into Everlast Tower and fortified well behind enemy defenses. Fighting their way past Frost Peak Passage, they defeat a giant ice golem, enter Eternia City proper, and learn many people, including Adia's mother, are all dependent on the healing energy being siphoned from the Earth Crystal. Making their way to Eternia's Central Command, they defeat an Automaton and Zombie Dragon, encounter Victoria and Victor waiting for them, defeat them, and gain their Arcanist and Spirit Master jobs. However, as they leave, the Vampire Lord Durasso ambushes and captures them. Adia is brought before her father, and he scolds her as the others are locked away in the dungeon. Adia escapes and frees the group, but finds themselves stuck at a gate. Unexpectedly, Sage Yuliana appears and reveals he is a founding member of the Council of Six that rules Eternia though left ever since Adia's father took control, and helps them out of their bind, though warns them that the road to ruin is often paved with good intentions. Learning that Adia's father has the key to the Earth Temple, they have no choice but to confront him, and at the same time, Adia's father reveals the secret of this world to Alternus and sends him away to carry out their mission should he fall. Now clashing wills with Grand Marshal Brave the Templar, Adia subdues her father without killing him and they gain the Templar job, and proceed to Everlast Tower. Along the way, they note Ringabel's journal has stopped producing prophecies and see a castle locked away by six keystones to be gained from fighting six elemental dragons across the land. Entering Everlast Tower and getting the Deus Ex summoned, they learn that long ago there was a massive plague that struck Eternia and while one cleric of the Earth Crystal wanted to use the crystal to cure the plague, the Vestal and Crystal Orthodoxy refused him and quarantined the country. Once the plague took its toll and subsided, the cleric was mocked and left, returning later to usurp the orthodoxy of Eternia and kill the Fire Vestal. The kill of the last Vestal was Adia's father, Brave the Templar. Finding the Earth Crystal hooked up to a machinery, the darkness escapes out in the form of the Gigas Lich, Propagator of Doom. Defeating and awakening the last crystal, Aerie informs them they now need to head to the Holy Pillar of Light that would appear. However, their voyage into the Holy Pillar is interrupted as Alternus intervenes, and as they fight they learn of his history with Brave and love for Adia. Still, they defeat him and earn the Dark Knight job. After the fight, his helm splits and shockingly reveals the same face as Ringabel's. 
As he tumbles overboard, he drops a journal identical to Tinkerbell's, right before the entire group is absorbed by the Holy Pillar. As the next chapter opens up, Tiz wakes up exactly as he had when his journey first started and Caldisla was still under attack by the Eternian Sky Knights, but this time, everyone is still with him. A slightly different area is vacant for answers, and they see the crystals are no longer awakened. At first, they wonder if they went back in time, but see they still have all their items they collected so far, including Alternus's journal and the Grand Ship. Not sure of what to do, they start by doing what they can by visiting the Crystal Temples again. Along the way, they defeat the dragons guarding the keystones to enter Lord Durasso's keep. He meets them and tells them of the old faith, which was the dominant culture before the Crystal Orthodoxy hostily took over. Though these events happened 2400 years ago, he was there and still lives to this day due to accepting an immortality pact. The Orthodoxy only called him a vampire for slanderous reasons, but he chose to embellish the rumor, eventually doing battle with the Inquisitor Yuliana, from which their battles left scars upon the world. Afterwards, separating the corruption of the church, Yuliana then later spread the job-wielding asterisks freely and prepared for the end of the corrupt Orthodoxy. He tests their strength, and once they prove worthy, they gain the vampire job, and he reveals to them how it was also foretold that a bringer of evil would befriend the Vestals and unleash chaos in the guise of awakening the crystals, and whose coming would be heralded by the Great Chasm. Continuing on, they visit the Crystal of Wind again, and find it indeed reverted, with Orthros back to menace them. Lighting the wind and water crystals again, they visit Yuliana, and while things start out the same as their first conversation, it's then revealed the sage knows this group is from another world. Speaking now to only Agnes and Tiz, he tells more of the angel that forged a union between Durasso and himself, telling it looked exactly like Agnes, and also warned them of the dangers of the crystals. He explains that awakening the crystals, done improperly, can destroy the borders to this world and unleash an event called the Harrowing. In fact, when they lit the crystal to the last world, they may have calmed nature, but also stepped closer to the harrowing. Cautiously chewing on those words, they proceed to light the crystals of fire and earth again and head to the holy pillar. This time, Alternus attacks, but this time, his target is Aerie, and as they fight, Alternus insists Aerie tricked all of them into letting the crystals run wild and needs to be stopped. Once more, they beat him and once more he falls overboard, but this time Ringabel has a flood of memories rush back, including a clue pointing to Ares' subtle shift in appearance. As the next chapter begins, they awaken in a new world again, this time in a world where Tiz died and his brother Till was the lone survivor, and once more, Ares is subtly different. Ringabel recalls something about the number 6, and then Adia being killed by some unknown monster. In private, he reveals he doesn't trust Aerie, and those paying attention to the title screen of the game get a chilling clue. In addition, the clues and events so far have him believing they are in a parallel world. Once more choosing to awaken all the crystals, after the wind crystal, Ringabel suddenly has another rush of memories, this time one where everybody but him dies. At the water crystal, Ringabel asks some pressing questions of Aerie, who suspiciously squirms under some direct queries. After the water crystal is awakened again, this time Ringabel has more memories return, this time of yet another subtly different Aerie standing over all their dead bodies except his. Next, at the fire crystal, Ringabel continues to ask more in-depth questions, including cross-referencing revelations from Brave the Templar. And again, Ringabel has a fainting spell with more memories coming back to him, this time of a yet another Aerie with a wing pattern that holds the ominous shape like the number 6 he recalled as a clue before, then shifting to a pattern resembling the number 5 that she bore when they first met her in the original world. Suddenly all becomes clear to him and he lets Tiz know in secret. He now remembers his time as Alternus the Dark Knight, even when he fought the group, up until they are killed and he loses his memory. He reveals he's been noticing the changes in the patterns on Ares' wings every time they travel to a parallel world, and points out the countdown pattern. From that logic, he deduces that he is the alternate from the parallel world before he met the current Tiz, and advises Tiz to pass this information along to Agnes in private. Remembering the opportunity to be alone with Agnes and the sage Yuliana, they head there next. Events playing out as expected, Tiz takes the opportunity to fish out answers about the Evil One and ask about the angel that appeared before Sage Yuliana and Lord Durasso 1900 years ago. Again, all clues line up with the story Ringabel has been recounting. In addition, Sage Yuliana tells him that even if destroyed, the core of a crystal can regrow to full size after thousands of years. In fact, one such core is the pendant Agnes wears and uses to summon other worldly friends. As they leave, Yoyana leaves them a note to meet him, and once doing so, they begin writing new fates for all of them. 
Starting with Ringabel, they meet with the alternates of this world, grieving for Adia, who is dead in this world already. However, after they calm him down with a fight, this alternate chooses to put down his blade rather than fall on the holy pillar as before. For Adia, she confronts her grieving parents and manages to fix up her family situation, setting her father on a different path of peace. For Agnes, Though she is dead in this world, Olivia is the last Vestal instead, and after saving her from dying, there is still hope for her friend and the crystallism faith. For Tiz, he finds his brother, consoles him, and helps him to rebuild their lost village. As they all have the opportunity to live in this parallel world where they are otherwise dead, they instead choose to continue their journey. Stating their decision to Yoyana, he tests their strength in battle to best him, and in doing so, they earn the final job from the creator of Asterisks himself, the Conjurer. In their parting, he tells Agnes to keep hold of the pendant she has, and to have the courage to think, act, and even disobey, that is, to bravely default. With all necessary preparations, they light the last earth crystal and head to the holy pillar, only this time Alternus won't interfere, and they choose to watch Aerie this time and confront the true darkness. Ringabel states to wait for the pattern change, and as the next chapter opens up, they wake in a different parallel world, and indeed, Aerie's wing pattern has shifted once more and relighting all the crystals again, they step into the next chapter, where they see the countdown of Ares' wings is now down to one. Relighting the crystals for the fifth and final time, they fly into the holy pillar, and the final chapter is finally here. They wake not in another world this time, but on the airship, where Ares is cheering victoriously. They check on the great chasm, but see it isn't shut, and Ares informs them that the link to other worlds will never shut, and proudly announces how she's suckered them this entire time. To prove her point, she takes her real form, that of a demonic bug, and reintroduces herself as Airy, demolisher of world bounds, and servant to Ouroboros, the god of destruction. She explains that every time all crystals in a world are lit, it becomes unstable with energy and breaks the dimensional walls, and links parallel worlds in the manner they have been traveling so far through the holy pillar that causes the great chasm. All of this for the return of Ouroboros to rise and devour the linked worlds. During the fight, they learn that previous versions of themselves have been used and eventually killed off by her when they too have figured out the deceit eventually, or bravely defaulted on their mission by breaking a crystal to thwart her, and this time she expects it to be no different. However, the Light Warriors win against her empowered form for the first time ever, and Aerie escapes after the fight to return to the Dark Aurora and the Grand Chasm to regain power. With the cycle broken, they meet with the sage Yuliana and Lord Durasso, and receive final instructions from the Angel of a Distant World. They travel back to the Grand Chasm, hot on the trail of Airy, who is desperate for the power to beat them. Ouroboros grants her her ultimate form, just as the warriors arrive to confront her. Waging their most difficult fight yet, they defeat Airy, who is then seized and devoured by Ouroboros, and takes the physical form of the party in order to speak to them. He is intrigued by the power of the party, and chooses to answer a few of their questions. He explains that he was to use the energy Airy collected to invade the Celestial Realm, home of the gods. In fact, he senses a Celestial hiding within Tiz's soul, as has been accused before. Growing bored of answering questions, he moves to now devour the party and attacks, changing into a more infernal form as the battle draws longer. As the fight is stalemated due to his regeneration, Lord Durasso comes in to counter the beast's immortality with his own and a maneuver that will sacrifice himself. However, in response, the beast blows up one of the linked parallel worlds and uses the energy to regenerate himself. Losing hope, Anya's prays to a crystal necklace, and suddenly, the heroes of life from the remaining thousands of linked worlds all connect their power through the necklace to empower the group facing Ouroboros. With countless lights connected, the bringer of ruin is destroyed. They receive thanks from the angel in all the celestial realm and are returned to their world. As Bravely Default concludes, the Sage comes to explain to them they can now choose to return to any parallel world they want, before the giant chasms that link them all close up. Indeed, they choose separate worlds, but go back to their original. Returning to their original world, Adia makes peace with her parents, Ringabel chooses to make the Grand Ship his new home as he travels on, Agnes goes to restoring the Crystallism faith, and Tiz goes back to Caldisla with Egil to resume his work. In the meanwhile, Agnes proceeds to reawaken the crystals, Adia takes up her father's mission for ideal peace, and Ringabel resumes his identity as Alternus to save another world from one of Ouroboros' leftover fairy servants. Six months later, with Tiz, he decides to return something he's borrowed. Moving to Caldisla's graveyard, he releases the borrowed celestial soul he's carried with him this whole time as his friends pass by. As the game ends, another fairy thanks us for stopping her sister Aerie, 
and we are treated to a trailer for the sequel, Bravely Second, where Tiz wakes up in a strange tank in a laboratory when a mysterious warrior named Magnolia frees him and shows off a new maneuver called Bravely Second. Bravely Default is looking to enjoy the success of selling over 1 million copies worldwide.